Creating your own reality. Is it possible for me? I am Jennifer K. Hill, the Consciousness Architect, and I am here to tell you that it's not only possible, it's closer than you might think. Welcome to the show. Hello, friends, and welcome back for another episode of Regarding Consciousness. I am your host, Jennifer K. Hill, and also CEO of Om.app OptiMatch. We are so grateful for you tuning in, listening, and following with us on this journey as we explore best-selling authors, scientists, and thought leaders from around the world as they share their wisdom on consciousness. Today, I have a new friend joining us, Jane Warlow, who is a global speaker, best-selling author, as well as sought-after business and executive coach, and is also the founder of Sacred Changemakers. Jane, thanks so much for being here with us. Oh, Jennifer, thank you for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. It's an honor. Thank you. Jane and I have had several fun conversations, and it's such a pleasure to dive into this idea of sacred change makers. Why don't you start by telling our listeners, our viewers, a little bit about what is a sacred change maker and how that came to be part of your calling and your mission? Yeah, thank you. Sacred Change Makers is, I think I can honestly say it's my, not only is it my passion, it's also my legacy work. And it's really about shifting our consciousness, elevating our consciousness. I'm beginning to see everything through the lens of different levels of consciousness and how that kind of creates our reality. How did it come about? In 2019, my daughter had gave birth to our first grandchild. I was at the birth and I actually caught Phoebe coming out. And it's really interesting, Jennifer, because what started as like just normal grandma joy and happiness that this little soul was in the world quickly turned to what I can only describe as like bone deep sadness. Now, it wasn't appropriate to share it with the room at the time. I didn't really understand what it was, but as I unpacked it in the weeks and months that followed, I realized that here's my daughter. She's English. She's married a Peruvian. She's given birth to this little Hispanic girl, and I realized this is not the world I wanted to bring her into. Now, I've worked in the change industry for over three decades, so it put me into this crucible of looking back on my career And how, even though I've been incredibly financially successful, I know I've impacted a lot of individual lives. I really thought, how much have things changed? And my sense is, not that much. As females, we still live in a a man's world. And I really wanted to do all I could to shift the world for the better, for my my granddaughter and for the generations to come. And I really looked back on my career and I thought, how can I shift what we're doing and where can I have the most impact? And I do believe that business is the biggest lever for change that we have. I And it's also being borne out by things like the Edelman Trust Barometer this year is showing that people are looking to business now, not government or politics to actually change things. They're actually looking to business. Yeah. And so that really spoke to me. And I thought, I'm not willing to work anymore in this space of full profit at any cost. So how it's not that's wrong. It's just that it's a limited kind of, it's like a limiting belief in a way. That's all we can do with business. And so how can we create more value through leadership and business? And I've always mapped consciousness against those things. And I'm doubling down now, less so on the kind of what I would call the external world of business and really doubling down on who do we need to be? Who do we need to become? And doing that inner journey work with leaders and entrepreneurs and coaches and consultants, really trying to get them to expand their notion of what change can be. Because it can be so much more than the I, me, mine conversation. It can also start to take account of the we, the collective, and what the world needs from our leaders and their leadership in the world today. I admire and respect deeply the work that you're doing, Jane. And at the same time, I also hear a lot of people saying in the business world, well, change is scary. We don't need to change. I was on a call with somebody earlier today about this, and they were saying, oh, we can't change things. People are very stodgy in the way we've done things, and it can be frightening for people. So how do we begin to enroll, engage, inspire people 
to feel comfortable with change and to dance with it rather than dodging it? Yeah, that's a great question because you're absolutely right. Nobody likes change, especially forced change through an organization. And it's really interesting. I think a really good mirror to have a look at this, the answer to this question, is to look at things like what the United Nations have done with the Sustainable Development Goals. Because in a way, it's a key mistake that they're now beginning to rectify. Because we think that business is out here. We think change is out here. But if nothing happens on the inside, whatever goes on outside is not sustainable in any way. So I think sometimes it's about asking a different question. Who do we need to be and become to actually embrace change, to actually be proactive around change? And this for me is where consciousness comes back in. It depends on what level of consciousness you're living your life at. Because if you're down in survival and say I'm up here talking in a sacred change maker speech about soul and inner journey and things, we're going to completely miss each other. And so it's really about understanding your own level, your home frequency of consciousness, which is where you love to be more than anywhere else. The, and you always know this because when you meet someone and they just instantly click with you, you just resonate right off the bat. You feel like they're old friends, right? Those are people that are at your, the similar frequency to you. But I think one of the big questions we have today in the world is how do we deal with difference? What do we do? Who do we become when we meet someone who's at a very different level of consciousness than us? Whether And it's not really about being higher or lower. It's about understanding all of the levels so that we can meet people where they are and yet not lose ourselves in the process. So when if I get back to the United Nations and the Sustainable Development Goals, they started off with all these external goals, right, which is exactly what the world needs now to actually put us onto a sustainable life path, if you like, for humanity. <laughs> That's what it is. But did it go down? No. Why? Nobody likes change. We don't want to be doing all this stuff when we're trying to do this stuff over here, which is make a profit, give, give back to our shareholders. And so if that's what we think business is, that's a level of consciousness that creates emotions and behaviors and decisions and the way that we do things and what we will and won't do, especially when it comes to change. But now, I think it was two years ago, they released the internal development goals because they realized that change doesn't happen out there. It, it really needs to happen if it's going to be sustainable on the inside. So who do we need to be? Who do we need to become? And so then looking at this through the lens of consciousness, we can start to realize that what we actually need is to expand our level of consciousness, uh, our awareness, so that we understand different realities in many ways. Because I, I work with nine levels and everybody, all those nine levels, they're completely different realities that we live within because they hold our beliefs, they hold our behaviors, our emotions, the way that we think about ourselves and the world, the way that we construct relationships. So if we can understand these things, then we can create resonance with people that we meet, we can read their energy, we can form a much more powerful relationship and a connection, and we can do things like inspire change because we understand the needs of each level and we understand also what what lights them up? Where's their life force energy? What is it about for them at that level? And so for me, it is about the full spectrum. And it's really about expanding and awakening and broadening our views of actually what's possible for us as humans. Mm. So powerful. That was an earlier conversation I was on today was about just that. Some gentlemen were having a business issue and it was so sweet. They were talking about how they would solve the business issue which was how they would want the problem solved for themselves. But from everything <laughs> described of the other people who they were in potential conflict with, I was like, have you considered actually if you meet them at their level, you meet them in a way to speak to them. And it's that old adage, one person speaking apple and another speaking orange. And literally two people, even though we both speak English, cannot hear each other. So talk to us about the nine different types or a little bit, give us some highlights maybe, and how we might utilize that to clarify and have our communication be more impactful. 
Yeah. So the nine types are actually, because it's quite a lot to go through it all in an auditory way for people listening. So I'll break it down into the three big groups, because in a way that they fall into the, the three subgroups. So the lowest level of consciousness is like the concrete worldview. I live in a physical world. I have to see it before I can believe it. And in many ways, it's also on the inner side. It's the foundations of the self. And this concrete world view is really that there, there isn't anything else. If you talk to a person with concrete world view about spirituality or soul, it's just like, what? It doesn't make any sense. They're just trying, they're in survival consciousness in many ways. They're trying to put food on the table for their kids. They're just trying to make this game of life work, work in some way for them and their family. And usually there's a lot of health issues down at the bottom just because the fact that their energy circuits are not running, they're not in flow, they're stuck with who they think they should be in the world. And so there's a lot of emotion and a lot of trauma down at the lower levels of consciousness. Having said that, this also ties in with Jungian development and Piaget, who talks about the psychosocial development of humans. So it aligns in with that as well, because we all go through this in our younger years. Then we get to the next level, which is more of a subtle worldview. This is where kind of our willpower and our intellect starts to kick in, but it's also the space of the heart. And I think of the heart very much around, I think in our education system, we're educated up to what I would know as level three. Now I do start with zero. So there's actually <laughs> level three has got zero, one, two, and three underneath it. And then when we get to four, level four, that is the level of the heart. I call it the edge walker energy. Why? Because it actually connects the lower levels with the higher levels. So what it means is, although this is a subtle worldview, it's like people in this level, they rely heavily on their education, their intellect, they're busy taking responsibility for their life at level three. Once they do that, they can move up through the heart. And then at level five, they can start to express their truth. So they're getting to know themselves on the inside and how they respond and how they react to the world outside. But it's very driven by an intellectual, academic, scientific mindset still. And it's what I call transpersonal consciousness. So we start to get a sense of the other. And we also start to get a sense of the relationship field and, and the invisible starts to kick in, meaning we have some sense there's something, but we don't fully understand yet what it is. Or maybe we know it intellectually. Maybe we've read some books and been on some courses, but we're not embodying it yet. Mm -hmm. And so that's the middle sphere. And then, of course, at the top, we have the meta worldview. We're, this is all about transcending the physical in many ways. This is the relationship with the sacred, with God, with the divine, whatever you call it. And really understanding that there's a unity consciousness up here. And it's a very different way of living life than either in the intellectual and emotional space in the middle or down at the bottom in survival consciousness. Because it, in a way, it's got very different language and emotions. Up here, people trust life. They trust life to show them their way. Right. Whereas down at the bottom, they're struggling to survive. So you can see this very different ways of being in the world. And because of that, what that means is people are actually living in very different realities. Why? Because it doesn't matter. The world is within. That's the relationship we build with life outside. And therefore, we go out into the world. And we know this from neuroscience now. We go out into the world to look for things that agree with what we believe. And there we are, we've got people living in very different worlds. It's no wonder that the way we deal with differences is, is so challenging for so many people. Because the paradox, I think, what I've learned over 30 years is in change is that people expect the other, right? Whoever that is, whether it's your primary relationship, your kids, your best friends, or your clients, or whoever it is, expect them to be and react like the self, like you said about your client. And yet on some level, we know that's not true, but primarily it's how we're stacked up. <laughs> and so when the world shows us that they're not like us, they don't value what we value, it's we don't know what to do with it. So we, we depending on what level of consciousness we're at, 
If we're down at the lower levels, then we'll start to try and convince them that they're wrong. It will, judgment will kick in, which is why one of the, my favorite quotes of all time around change is the Rumi quote, out beyond the field of right and wrong, there is a field. I mean, yeah. Mm. That is asking somebody to go from the concrete worldview really into a more subtle realm beyond judgment to really start to find what's really there beyond the socialization and who I think I should be. <laughs> I love that quote by Rumi. And it's interesting when you say that, Jane, what occurs to me is that if you have somebody that perhaps is at the lower level, and you have two people at the lower level, mm -hmm. even though theoretically it seems like they're both speaking the same language, that there would be a background of relatedness because of vibrationally how they're aligned. It also occurs for me that perhaps at this lowest level that you're talking about, the base level, that's where a lot of the conflict would come from because there's a lot of blame and shame and only existing what's right there in front of you. You took my sunglasses or whatever it is. Right. So it's interesting because we don't, again, moving past the field of right and wrong, as Rumi so beautifully put it, how do we allow for that? Let's say, for example, your coach, I'm sure you encounter this in your life. Let's say you have somebody and you can sense or however you measure it, the person is at maybe a level two or three and they're not at the level where that they want to be. There's a desire there for them to evolve their consciousness and to be more present with their family, more present with their employees, better leader, whatever that looks like. How do you meet them there to Rumi's point? Like, how do you meet them at level three if you're at the level seven or eight? Yeah. So you brought up a really important point because so far I've been talking developmentally. And one of the things, if there's any coaches listening, when you're in coach training, one of the first things you learn is you can't take anybody further than you've gone yourself. Mm -hmm. So in a way, what I've been speaking to is your home frequency. However, in any hour, minute, any day, we actually move beneath, be around all of the levels, right? Mm -hmm. So what that means is even though my home frequency might be at five or six or wherever it is, that's where, that's the frequency that gives me the most energy. That's my comfort zone. That's where I feel at home. Mm -hmm. But for example, if my kids come home, right, and then they don't do the dishwasher and they can plunge me into the lower levels <laughs> faster than anything else, right? So where does it begin? It begins with awareness, of course. First of all, do I notice when I'm being pulled into those lower levels? Because we all go there, right? We all have our triggers. And it, have I done my inner work? So I can thankfully say now, and I won't say it never happens, but some of the trauma from my childhood no longer triggers me in the way it used to because I'm aware of it. I notice when it happens. I know, oh, that sounds like my mother speaking, right? Somebody's projecting onto me now like my mother did. And so part of this is about your levels of self-awareness. Are you aware of your shadows? Are you aware of your trauma? Are you aware of what triggers you? Do you know what the root cause is of that? And have you done your own inner work to be able to go, okay, I can witness that. I can see that. I can move through that. Instead of reacting, I can be more responsive to it. So you're absolutely right that, and the other thing to know is in many ways, some of the stuff, because we live in linear reality in human life, the models that I've put together show like nine levels, almost like a ladder, because it's almost like an elevator. You can go up and down in the elevator and you can get out and you're on a different floor and it's very different to where you got in. Same kind of analogy. But what we think and what we tend to think is that, oh, I want to get to the top because that's how we're programmed. But no, that's not what this is about because the top is great in some situations, but the bottom is also great in some situations. If you are spiritual and you're floating around in the ether, but you want to get something done in the <laughs> physical world, you've got to come down, right? Because so it's not just about being all spiritual and being like a Buddha and sitting under a Bodhi tree. It's actually knowing how to harness the power and the energy of each level so that you know which environments, relationships, and circumstances you need to pull on this level 
right? So that's, it's the flexibility, the agility, something I call full spectrum resonance that makes all the difference. It's so true. It's an easy trap to fall into, Jane, to believe that, oh, if I reach the higher levels of consciousness, then I have no problems. You also, you could sit around on a mountaintop all by yourself for the rest of your life. (laughs) We came here to eat chocolate and have fun, go on roller coasters. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> what was life is is one big roller coaster, and I think that one of the lessons that I know I'm going to take away from this uh, conversation today is to allow for the beauty in all of it, and that trap of falling into the judgment. Oh, I'm bad. I'm stuck in the physical. It's not about that. The people I've talked to, like yourself and Krita Jane, I would love your feedback on this. What I found is that as we evolve our consciousness, we get choice. And we can choose just as much to be at the base level. I'm going to be pissed. My husband will hold me sometimes. I'll be and he handed me a plate to break a few months ago. It was fantastic. (laughs) Best level zero or one I've ever had in my life. I was like, yes. But then I chose not to sting in that. Then again, you can elevate. And it's choosing at any moment, almost like an elevator. What floor am I going to put on? Rather than just being stuck between one and two or one and three or one and five. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And to go back to your point about sacred change makers, I think one of the most powerful things that my clients have fed back to me is understanding where their change process or their transformation process sits in the nine levels. For example, if you're thinking about marketing, your client was saying, making the mistake earlier, we often think, oh, I'm going to write a message or or an email that would speak right directly to me. No, if you know where your level is and you know where your clients are before they work with you, Mm -hmm. and then you know where you want them to be after they've worked with you, it makes a huge difference to really understand what that transformation is in terms of consciousness. And so for me, that makes the change process much easier for people to say yes to. Because the other thing is you've got to make it visible. You can't sell the invisible, Mm -hmm. right? And change is invisible. So you've got to make it so that people can understand the journey you're going to take them on. And then it makes everything a lot easier. (laughs) I love it, Jane. What a fun conversation. I I love how vivid and visceral and visual this conversation was. I think that whether you were watching us or listening with us, you could really see in your mind's eye these different levels that Jane was talking about. So Jane, is there anything I didn't ask you about this work you're doing or something else that you'd love to leave our listeners with before we dive into where they can connect with you? Um, I don't think so. I think in a way we've given them a nice introduction. I think the only thing I would say is that life is relational. I think it's all about relationships. And I don't just mean the external ones, the internal ones too. Like how you define your relationship with yourself, your relationship with your life, in many ways defines, I think, the way you show up to relationships with others. And then, of course, there's your relationship with the sacred and the divine within you. What does that mean? And for a lot of people in the modern world, it doesn't mean a great deal because we seem to have lost our relationship with the sacred. And I don't necessarily mean organized relation religions here, the sacred. And there's one question that I ask of my clients, and it's just simply this. If you considered your life to be sacred, what would be different? Mm. And I think that it's a higher level consciousness question, definitely, but it kind of inspires and elevates you to think about life in a different way from just the mundane routines and work and family and all the stuff we have to do every single day. There's more potential here waiting for you. So just know that. And when you're ready, the teacher will appear. (laughs) Well, you were definitely my teacher today, Jane, and I know many of us, I always intend whenever we do have these shows that something we say makes a difference for one or more people. And that's what it's all about. In these times, could we do one act of kindness? Could we share a smile when we don't feel like sharing a smile? Could we open a door for a stranger? It's these little micro moments that lead to the more max moments that allow us to live the life of our dreams. And 
I think that you've definitely given us a roadmap to do that today, Jane. Where can people connect with you if they want to follow your work, say good change makers? Where should they go? Yeah, definitely. My home online is sacredchangemakers.com. You can go and find out there about all of my work, but also I'm on all the social media platforms as well. And I'd love to hear from anyone who's interested. So beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Today, we've had Jane Warlow with us sharing her wisdom from her work with Sacred Change Makers. And I invite you as you go forth into this week, whenever you're listening to this and wherever, to begin to explore, maybe map where you are today, maybe just based on the little bit that Jane shared with us, maybe make a little map or a diagram visually. Another friend of mine even had me years ago put together like a rainbow of where you're at and see, and then check every few months, just ask, what is my base vibe? Where am I? And is this where I'm committed to being? And if not, then engage in some of the questions that Jane just asked engage into, if I treated my life as sacred, how might I live my life differently? And go out and play with that. Thank you so much for being here with us today.